While video games have evolved mechanically and visually in a ton of wonderful ways, they're capable of being as flawed as any medium. For every revolutionary feature we can't believe nobody thought of earlier and genre blend that changes the definition of what games can be, there are those little painful things we just kinda wish games would stop doing. We're gonna be getting very granular here, but as much as we celebrate the vast majority of our favorite games for everything they got right, this is our little safe space to point the finger at some video game cliches and pitfalls that kinda suck. I'm Jess from What Culture, and here are 10 things video games really need to stop doing. Number 10. Not letting you play the bit that looks really fun to play. Now we don't like to establish too many must-haves for all video games, as they're all fascinating and unique creatures in their own right. That said, if a game is gonna have a character do something incredibly cool, you better bloody let us do it, and not just sit back limply holding the controller, thinking about how awesome it would have been to actually play that bit. The largest offender in this particular category are games that don't let you land the final blow on that big boss that you've been sweating it out battling for the last hour or so. Instead, they let you get all the way to the end and then quietly let you know you can take a back seat while they enter into a cutscene where your character does something super cool, finishing off the encounter with an epic blow that you didn't even get to initiate. It's the equivalent of the video game taking credit for all your hard work while you sit back and go, okay, yay me. We are simply no longer having it. Number 9. Invisible Walls this is one of the features on this list that's going to come off as an unfortunate reality for any devs trying to make open world games, but that doesn't stop it from being immersion breaking and frustrating. There's nothing quite so unfitting with your sprawling gorgeous fantasy world than bumping up against an invisible wall. While to be fair this one isn't so prevalent in games these days, it hasn't entirely gone away. This goes double for games that show you something exciting off in the distance, but it turns out you can't actually get there and it doesn't exist in the game. Morrowind was game changing for being set on an island and letting you swim off indefinitely in any direction by spawning repeating water tiles, if for some reason you wanted to do that. Meanwhile, playing an exploration epic like Fallout 3 and hitting a certain point and then being told we cannot proceed any further for reasons was a little frustrating. Number 8. Doors that aren't actually doors. Last time I did a list in the same vein as this one, I said that if I was a politician, I'd run on the platform that crap ladders, which your character can't grip onto properly in video games, need to end. For this list, I'll add, let doors be doors and not just scenery that doesn't go anywhere. It's pretty standard to accept that a door is a fairly interesting thing in a video game. Usually home to a quest, chest or mysterious interior, there's always something to entice us. Except for when a door is not a door, it's just a fancy piece of wall. Wandering all the way over to a curious looking door just to find it's not interactable makes us second guess all doors. While it often requires a Herculean effort from a hundred strong developer team to ensure every door of every domicile is part of the level design and actually goes somewhere, it does make a difference to the gameplay experience. It's tricky to find an RPG or open world game that doesn't have at least a few doors that are just there for aesthetics, but when you can, you'll really notice it. Number 7. Mandatory Long Tutorial Sections I'm not here to gatekeep and I know some people who pick up a video game might be doing it for the first time and do need to be versed on the basics, but I think it's about time that tutorials which make us press W to move forward at least become optional. Spending full minutes learning how to walk and pull out a gun when the buttons are the same in almost every video game could at least be streamlined to allow for the majority of gamers who just want to get cracking. There's nothing terribly wrong with these mind-numbingly detailed tutorials, so long as it lets the rest of us skip through them without missing anything important. While games like Black and White 2, Nier Automata, Pokemon Sun and Moon, and more recently Deathloop have infamously painful tutorials, at least the latter lets you turn off tutorial messages if you dig into the menu settings. Bless Far Cry Blood Dragon for including its tutorial called Military Program for Idiots, which includes gems like Press X to demonstrate your ability to read. Of course, not every game can turn its tutorial into a joke, so for that, we'll tip our hats to games like Half-Life and Deus Ex that house their tutorials in training ground areas or menus, where you can get caught up in the basics if you need them, but they exist separately from the main game. All of that being said, if it's not the tutorial to Driver, at least we know it can always get worse. 
Number 6. Characters in cutscenes having different skill sets than in gameplay. This one sort of exists in counter to our earlier entry about not getting to actually play the cool bits in cutscenes, but they revolve around the same issue, which is sometimes the character we're playing doesn't match up with the character in cutscenes. Whether it's their personality, equipment, or skill set, there are a few occasions where the ludo narrative dissonance hits a little too hard. If you're not familiar with that one, it's basically when the story and gameplay mechanics don't line up with each other. For instance, Red Dead Redemption 2, fantastic as it is, falls into this trap, as the whole story revolves around the Vandalin gang repeatedly putting themselves in harm's way to scrounge together enough money to hightail it off to Tahiti. Which is fine, except if you've been busy off earning money at Arthur, you've got plenty of cash to throw everybody's way and solve any problem that comes up. But the game needs to ignore that so the story makes sense. Other prime examples of characters acting curiously differently in cutscenes include Cloud getting cornered by Shinra soldiers in Final Fantasy VII, even though he's blasted through the dudes without breaking a sweat for the last hour, and infamously hated Mass Effect 3 baddie Kai Leng donning unparalleled plot armor despite Shepard taking down entire Reapers by this point. Then there's watching your level capped beastly hero get sucker punched just so it can initiate the villain's last stand. Number 5. Binary Morality System Morality systems are exciting in role-playing games because they let you choose how you want to engage with the NPCs around you and the narrative as a whole. While that's all well and good, there's a difference between creating a choice-based morality system that's nuanced and one that's incredibly binary. Usually, it's the latter. Take Knights of the Old Republic, where you're either the ultimate light side savior and boy scout, giving all your money away to the poor and saving the universe, or you're a murdery pure evil Sith Lord right up there with a the cartoon villain. A lot of these games boil down to being everybody's errand boy or killing anybody that looks at you sideways and then they slap a morality system label on it and call it a day. Sure, it's still nice to have a choice, but if it's like Mass Effect where you're either sucking up to everybody or smashing that renegade action to punch NPCs in the face, it's a little basic. These morality systems often mean it boils down to being way too nice to everyone or way too mean, because games like KOTOR punish you for not devoting yourself fully to the light side or dark side lifestyle. Number 4. 3D Platformers Not Indicating Where You'll Land This is an entry that doesn't need a lot of explanation. While things are getting better, especially in the case of studios who've been around the block when it comes to creating stellar platforming experiences, there are still platformers that are nigh on unplayable because you just can't be precisely sure about where it is your little guy's gonna land. This is one of those things that makes it pretty hard to go back and play older platformers, and in 2022, if it's a new game, it's pretty completely unforgivable. Sonic Unleashed is a great example of a game that fumbles with this mechanic, as in its night stages, the Werehog doesn't have a shadow on the ground, making the platforming wildly frustrating. As game engines have evolved, this has become way less of a problem, but enough of us were burned by early 3D platformers that I think we can safely say we never want to see video games doing this ever again. Number 3. Scripted Fail States there's something that feels particularly unfair about pulling off a tricky boss encounter or series of quick time events only to arrive at a scripted fail state. So tumbling down a waterfall in Tomb Raider the remake at one moment is an insta death, but if you do it four quick time events later when you're supposed to, voila, you're at the next chapter. Heavy Rain, Until Dawn and Uncharted are also classic offenders of this particular frustration, where you're left wondering why you bothered to avoid certain peril dozens of times, only to fall victim to scripted peril mere moments later. Outside of quick time and platforming heavy sequences, the same thing can happen in boss fights that you aren't ever supposed to win. When you're absolutely trouncing a boss and the game interjects with a cutscene showing that you lost, it feels pretty unfair. A perfect example of this is the sci-fi butthead we've already mentioned once on this list, Mass Effect's Kai Lang. It doesn't matter how easily you beat him up, the following cutscene has you lose because of reasons. Number 2. Respawning you without all the stuff you just used in the last attempt. If you're failing at a game, usually you'd expect more handholding, not less. Not so for games that will let you fail at an attempt once and then keep all the resources that you used in that attempt. Destiny 2 is a great example of games that screw you over in this particular regard. Die during a boss fight and sure, you'll respawn, but you'll do so without the ammo you used in the last fight. 
If you're thinking somebody who couldn't pull it off the first time is probably not going to be able to do it with even less resources at their disposal, you'd be right. If the boss is going to come back swinging at full health, it feels like the least a game can do is let you have another shot at it with the arsenal you came in with at the start. On top of this, punishments for dying in general are pretty crappy. Whether it's Dead Island sapping 10% of your money, or Borderlands 2 slowly sapping your ammo and money. While some people are gluttons for punishment with this kind of mechanic, plenty more of us could happily do without it. Number 1. My superhuman protagonist can't do stuff I can do. I'm putting this one at number 1 not because it's the most irritating thing video games do or because it spoils video games that include it, but because it's my favourite tiny annoyance, it's pretty entertaining, and it comes up a lot. Of course video games have to put limits on what our protagonist can do, otherwise we just breeze our way through games. But when our incredible witcher mutant hero or souls hero can't step over a 3 foot fence, it's a little hard not to notice. It's instances like this that make games like Breath of the Wild and Assassin's Creed Odyssey stand out as refreshingly different, as everything is sensibly surmountable. Commander Shepard and Geralt's inability to step over rubble or climb ledges, or in Geralt's case, get himself out of water and onto a shore without a ladder or a very generous ramp to help him, is pretty annoying. Add to that things like Minecraft Steve's inability to climb two blocks without a ladder, The Last of Us's packed stairwells blocking whole floors, and instances in games like Silent Hill or Resident Evil where a glass window or wooden door blocks your path even though your backpack is chock full of firepower that could take care of it. I don't expect video game characters to be able to do everything, but if it's something an unfit gamer like me could do, it might be something we should revisit. That's the end of our list, but as always, do let me know what you think down in that comment section and if you can think of any things that you'd really like video games to stop doing. As always, I've been Jess from What Culture. Thank you so much for hanging out with me. If you're liking, come say hi to me on my Twitter account where I'm at Jess McDonald. But make sure you stay tuned to us here for plenty more gaming goodness.